Can you see that? Can you see my screen now? Yes. Looks good. Okay. So I can see your browser. Yeah. I prepared a little uh, slideshow. Um, yeah. I I released a small library. It's called PureScript GraphQL uh, a couple of days ago, I guess last week somewhere. And uh, I was asked if I could not maybe talk a little bit about this here at this meetup. So I'm... I'm excited to to get this chance. Um, simply called PureScript GraphQL. Uh, other libraries have like really cool names, like Sam Sangria or for Alexia is called Absent. Uh, I felt like this PureScript uh, actually the Boa name was already taken and was really difficult to to actually get it. But I got the plain PureScript GraphQL because I feel like such a small community uh, that's kind of. SEO is so important, like recognition is so important and the name should be really simple. Um, but I also had some, some fun names uh, for the library. Uh, my favorite one was ethanol because uh, that's just pure alcohol and the other ones seem to be drinks. So, uh, <laughs> that's a good idea. <laughs> so this is about pure functional programming, right? Um, and yeah, it's a wrapper around the library, uh, around GraphQL.js. So, this is by no means a, a GraphQL implementation in a sense that it contains a parser and execution engine and so on. It's just a wrapper. Um, but on the other hand, that's pretty cool because we have like a well-tested library in the background and we can, uh, we don't have to test any of the execution and so on. It's just about wrapping everything and some other gimmicks that I did uh, that I will present. Um, yeah, my name is Hendrik. Uh, you can also check out my Twitter if you want to. Um, not much going on there yet, but I hope maybe at some point there will be some more stuff about what I do. Know so you said that this is just a wrapper. So will this yeah. make it production ready? <laughs> because the underlying <laughs> library is production ready? Yeah, I don't know, <laughs> really. Um, I'm, not, I'm not using it in production <laughs> anywhere. And... Uh, I don't use PureScript at all in production anywhere, uh, which is sad, but uh, maybe we're still, most of us are doing this in our free time, right? Um, but I yeah. think if if it turns out that it works pretty well and it's really hard to write tests, right? Because it's just this wrapper. Um, but if everything seems to be okay, a few lines of code, then maybe it's already ready to be used in production. Um, maybe I start a bit with what, what GraphQL is. Um, GraphQL is a query language for APIs. So it's like SQL, a uh, structured query language, but this GraphQL is to query graphs. And that is very interesting because most of our data is actually graphs. And it was developed by Facebook and they have, I guess, one of the prime use cases, which is a social network for graph-like data and... Um, I have a question uh, about that. Yes. Uh, like you say that the, like most of the data that we work with is graphs, right? Mm -hmm. uh, I, when, when I think of most of the data I work with, I think of like relational databases, mm -hmm. right? Where I have a table and that has a, a foreign key to a different table. Um, is this a graph? Uh, it is in a sense, if you say, okay, this foreign key is kind of a connection then to the next entity again. So this is, this is how mm -hmm. you do it. Um, and that's the, the cool thing about GraphQL is that you don't have these, um, these kind of references and then you need to do another request or somehow join, but these joins become super easy. So you can just say, okay, I want this object and this object. We, can, we will see how this works um, in a bit. Because it, it seems like it's like a linked list of, of some sort where you start with one entity and then you can follow a reference to a new entity. But like once you're at the new entity, you can't go backwards to the old entity because there's no pointer directly from this entity to mm -hmm. the one that you came from. So in, in this aspect, it's, it's not like a doubly linked list. It's just like you can go yeah. one way. So is, is, is GraphQL like a... Mm, like, it tries to make a different abstraction on top of this relationship where um, you have to define how to go backwards and forwards between this relationship. Yeah, roughly. Uh, I'll, I'll talk a bit about this in a, in a second, I think. Um, and 
what you usually in your in your day job do when you do a uh, GraphQL uh, server side, then you mostly spend your time of creating these connections in so-called resolvers. Um, I will get to this in a bit. Um, but the idea is basically that what Facebook tried to do is get their front-end developers very productive, right? They wanted their front-end developers to be really empowered and they also had some more requirements and the idea is not new. So there are other things out there that had somehow the same idea like Falco, which is a kind of restful API specification. But we will see some of the benefits of GraphQL in a second. Um, what is the, the coolest thing for me about GraphQL is this statically typed API. Like the API has types and these types are acting as a contract between the client and the, the server that offers the API. And the types or the definitions cannot be breached. So it's a bit different than, for example, a RESTful API specification um, that, what's it called? Um, Swagger is an open API? Swagger, yes, right. Swagger is the, is the right right name uh, where you can kind of automatically give your API a definition but in GraphQL this is really a contract and if I would actually return something from our API that's defined for example as a string which is a number my API will actually be angry about it um, in in many dynamically typed languages there's a runtime error right but with PureScript we actually want to get a bit deeper and want to have this at compile time and I will show how we will do this. Um, I have a question about that. Mm -hmm. um, statically typed API. I'm I'm curious exactly like uh, what that type word refers to because like mm -hmm. uh, for like a pure script person, uh, type kind of refers to like a product type or a sum type, and it's like tag tagged unions here. Mm -hmm. um, and then there, there's also like the record types, mm -hmm. the structural yeah. typing. Um, so mm, it's it's. For yeah, GraphQL. So, yeah, so, yeah, okay, yeah, continue. GraphQL is more about these structured types, right? Like you would, would mm -hmm. think about like C types, right? You have kind of primitives and you have uh, structures and they somehow come together. So it's, it's not in a way that we talk about types on a higher level in, in like pure script. Uh, but for an API, this is actually exactly what you want, right? You want to know what is the structure of the API? What does the API offer? And um, because we will in the end communicate in JSON and we want to know uh, what data we can get from the API. And one of the reasons why it was developed uh, by Facebook is um, that they wanted to evolve the API without breaking it. So if you have REST endpoints, a REST endpoint will always return the same result, right? Um, you cannot really modify it. So if you want to add a field to that API, um, that can be a bit challenging because your clients actually don't expect the field. And especially if you, um, maybe when you're in JavaScript, that doesn't really matter because JavaScript will just take the object, right? And JSON pass it. But if you're on, uh, on a mobile app, this might actually make a difference. And also what they saw is that often um, not all clients used old fields. So you had like these huge endpoints that would return a lot of fields, but some parts of the app weren't really using it. So they wanted a solution for uh, adding fields without um, breaking clients. Um, and they also wanted a solution that is good for low bandwidth and high latency. So they, Facebook was really expanding in the third world and there you actually don't have always people on, on desktop PCs on nice uh, DSL connections, right? They are actually using their phones. And if you work with REST APIs, you have a lot of round trips, right? First you fetch, let's say your friends and then you fetch the friends of your friends and then you have to actually go and uh, have these cascades of of requests and they wanted to have a solution where you um, first don't overfetch or underfetch so you always get exactly the data that you need and you also have the ability to be uh, to send really powerful queries 
um, there are some some ideas in REST that try to solve this problem. For example, one of this is this idea of um, endpoints for front ends. So you have basically a REST API and then have you pr another proxy that builds like these very specific endpoints for each front end. Um, composing that from the from the REST API, but GraphQL is a bit more powerful than that. And they, as I said, they wanted to enable their front-end developers. So they wanted something that's really, really powerful to, um, to use as a front-end developer that puts a lot of power into the hands of front-end developers. Okay, now we're gonna see real quick how this works. Um, and because this is about PureScript GraphQL, uh, let's actually start uh, running a server that runs PureScript. And um, this is the repository, PureScript GraphQL. And I've already mentioned it real quick before this talk. Here's an example repository that we can go to. And uh, let's actually start by, by cloning it. Oops. No, now I'm used to my MacBook. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, and I think we will also need a bit of a different name. So this is actually the, the easiest way to get started is to clone this example repository. Because otherwise you um, have a bit of a problem because PureScript GraphQL is just a, a GraphQL implementation and it does not specify the transport layer or anything. So if you want a HTTP server actually serving this GraphQL, you need to write a bunch of extra code. Um, but I've done that for you in, in this repository and we can have a quick look into how it works. So we will have to install the NPM dependencies. Uh, that's a bit unfortunate, but as I said, it's a wrapper and this repository mostly contains uh, um, dependencies on this GraphQLJS library. And uh, we also have our PureScript dependencies, which are right now done with BOA. And we can install them. And then we can uh, simply run pull run. Yeah, okay. <laughs> and we can already prepare this one. We'll have a A simple GraphQL endpoint running. So GraphQL, in GraphQL, everything runs through the same endpoint, and you just have one endpoint for all types of queries. So this wrapper that you made, this is just a wrapper for defining the server side of a Graph, GraphQL thing, right? Um, because I think there's also libraries to help you construct a query, which you can then send to a GraphQL server, right? Yes. So this one's just the server. This is all about the server side. Um, in the front end, of course, there are lots of clients, what we call GraphQL clients, um, but this is a server-side implementation that helps you build GraphQL APIs. Um, maybe at the end, we can quickly talk about cool clients. Recently, there was uh, Elm GraphQL released, uh, which I think will be really cool to look into if we wanna have something similar for PureScript. Um, I do, at work, I do all of my, um, programming just in JavaScript and with flow types. And I also have an interesting project around generating types for clients, but on the server, it's a bit of a different story. And when we test our, our GraphQL queries, um, we use a, a graphical client. So where we can on the left side, write our queries. And on the right side, we will see, see the result. And what we will also have is uh, API definition. We can actually in real time browse the API, how the API looks, because GraphQL also has meta queries. And we can ask a GraphQL server, hey, what is actually the structure of your API? What types do you offer? What queries, what mutations? And we can now do that. And we will see, we will have a, I hope this is actually viewable through, through the um, through the video conference, um, but we yeah, have we have on the right side we can actually browse the schema and see what the server offers, and we see the server has two queries, 
and three mutations. And this is the example. It's about a normal, like a basic block, a block where you can do some posts. And um, so it has a, a query that's called posts where I can get all posts. Ah, the description is already a bit off. This one is better. Here we can get a single post and um, every field can have a description. Everything has a description. And we can also query these descriptions and see them in our interface. And so we have a query that's called post and it returns a post. And post again is kind of an, an object that has multiple fields again, the ID, the title and the content. And we can start simply by typing a query and we already see, okay, we get here like some nice completion. That is what I mean with um, developer experience. And I guess we all, we all hope to have something like this uh, because I think this is probably the best community to, to talk to when talking about static types. A lot of people, when you, when you, um, when you say, oh yeah, it's like, it's a statically typed API. A lot of people are like, oh, why? Like, why would you do that? Um, but I think it's slowly also getting uh, to the JavaScript community that types well are really helpful. Will you show us uh, how these types and this post type and, uh, and wh where this is defined on the server side? I want to see that later too. That is uh, definitely what we'll be looking into um, because this is just a basic GraphQL introduction, right? Um, mm -hmm. When we do this, we actually don't get a post because we don't have posts yet. Uh, let me quickly do that. We will create some posts um, with my prepared Where am I creating? <laughs> okay, I was already playing around a bit. Um, we get another post. We get some more posts. Let's actually instead query all posts now. And we get the back list of posts. Um, and now we see the the beauty of GraphQL. When I go and remove the content field, actually our contents are gone. Right. So let's say I have an overview where I just see the title. We can say, oh, I, now I can see the title. But then let's say we have another view that, that talks about a specific post. We can create a query that's like post ID. And then we can get the content again. Or we can remove the title. So the query on the right, the result reacts to actually what query I do. It's like an SQL where you can say, oh, I want this field and this field, and please don't send me these fields. So how did it know to return, return uh, an object, just a single post instead of uh, a list of posts? Mm -hmm. That's how I define it. So um, all these kind of queries and fields are uh, defined internally and we'll, we'll see. I think we okay, will so just it's a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a separate endpoint on the server side. When you specify a parameter, it hits a different endpoint in the server side? A yeah. Different handler. Um, yeah, so we stop thinking in endpoints here in GraphQL. We rather think in terms of graphs, right? And this post, I use the posts query. Okay. Or I use the a single. returns an array. With a and, single. Okay. Right, where we can get a specific post using its ID. So all queries are somehow defined here on the top level. And then here we get kind of the the content. So posts is one entity in this graph and post mm -hmm. like one post is like a, those are two different entities, right? Yeah, you, you could say it like this. So I think the, unfortunately this example is not very good because it's very small, right? It's mm -hmm. just a example server. So I, uh, I'd really like oh, to okay. get into yeah. um, how this all works. Maybe if you're, interested after the talk you can for example check out this uh oops let me go with my chrome um maybe we that would be cool if they have it running somewhere please <laughs> oh 
Oh yes. Okay. Cool. Um, so this is like the the official example from GraphQL.org. Um, query root. Okay. There we go. And here we can do much more. And we will also see what is interesting. Why we're talking about about graphs because. What we can do is we can actually go deeper and deeper into the graph. So where, as you said, with this relational data, at some point we, we would be done with one entity and would go deeper, um, we can actually go and We don't have a person. Let's say all all people or something. All people. Can we do that? No. Oh, we need a connection. So this is actually built around this um, around this uh, specific type of GraphQL schema, which is always a bit bad to use because it has some types in between. We have these edge types. Um, but what we can see here is that we can go kind of uh, deeper and deeper and we can get the name of the person and then we can get its home world and from the home world we can get the name again and then we can get the climates. I don't know if we can go any deeper. Residence. So. And it gets bigger, right? We can see, okay, Luke lives on Tatooine and on Tatooine also C-3PO lives and Darth Vader <laughs> and so on. And then we can go and further, further and deeper, deeper, right? And we can also move in circles if we want to. We can, you know, go back to Homeworld again. And, you know, at some point the query probably gets too expensive for the server and the server, uh, if it's not... Uh, guarded against these query exploits, it, it kind of uh, will spend a uh, big time actually doing uh, query execution. Um, so this is how GraphQL works. So the main features are I choose as a, as a front-end developer during the query, I choose what fields are returned and I have the ability to um, actually go deeper and deeper into the graph, which is something which you can cannot do in REST simply, right? Um, you have to then go to the next endpoint and from there go to the next endpoint and have these query cascades. And here you can just send one single query that's kind of tailored to what data you want to have. I have a question about uh, a GraphQL syntax. I see the exclamation mark, is that optional? Like what is the meaning of exclamation mark? You mean on the right? Yeah, if you see, you yes. see an exclamation mark, for example, uh, it was more on your post example. I saw one there too. Yeah. Um, so in GraphQL, it's exactly the opposite than in most modern languages and things are nullable by default. And oh. you can then add the non-nullable. And this just means that ID is required or um, that posts will always return an array mm. and the posts in that array will never be null. Um, mm. I'm a big fan of non-nullable types. Uh, there are, of course, lots of discussions around schema definitions. Uh, Facebook is a big fan of null, uh, nullable types because they say they, there can always something go wrong, right? <laughs> and well, yeah. Front-end team to actually write um, very safe code. So, yeah. I think there's also some consensus um, amongst the experts uh, for data interchange formats uh, uh, make everything optional because then you're backwards and forwards compatible. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, I think that's a reason for having non nullable. Yeah. If you still, if you want, if you want to have non nullable, uh, you can still use the this nullable interchange format, but you add the non nullable type checking in in the client point of it, rather than in the data interchange format. You just like say this client. Uh, is going to use this post type 
and this post type is always going to have ID content title, even though in the data interchange format, you know, it could be there, it could not be there. It depends on what the user queries. Um, yeah. Maybe. Yeah, that's a good point, but it doesn't really apply to GraphQL because you're always forward compatible. Because if I would now introduce a comment field on posts, a client that runs this query doesn't care, right? This is the part about I'm not breaking my clients by adding something to my API. Well, you know, GraphQL, um, you can still break compatibility with clients in GraphQL if you change a field name, per, like, right? I mean, it's still proper management of your schema. Yeah. Right. So you are not allowed to, to change field names. Um, this is, for example, what Facebook does. They never change field names. Once they're in production, you cannot change them. But this is by convention, right? Yes, by convention, but there are also tools that help you and say, okay, you just broke the schema. Um, oh. so Big, big thing in the GraphQL community, and for example, there are also services that do that for you. For example, the Apollo um, engine does that for you. It checks your schema and then alerts you if you broke something, or you can run some tools that look at your schema and and actually track the changes. Um, so, hmm. okay. But you can introduce non-breaking changes, which is something that you cannot do to a REST endpoint, assuming. Um, that in a REST endpoint actually adding a field would be a breaking change. But if I would add the comments field and the query is still the same, I still get exactly the same data back, right? Okay, let's uh, maybe continue. Mm -hmm. And then the question is, okay, how do we actually get from this query to, um, to the result, right? Um, what in the background is actually happening? And I think that's, that was your question, Alex. Uh, how does yeah. it actually work? Like, how do we define these types? How do we come from um, someone says, oh, I want this post. How do we then get the right post and get the right results? And this is what, what uh, PureScript GraphQL is all about, right? This is the part that PureScript GraphQL defines. Um, so let's actually uh, split this here and start uh, an editor. Okay. Um, let's have a quick look. The main thing of that we work around is the schema. So the schema is the definition of the types. It contains all the types. The schema has two types of operations in PureScript GraphQL. There are actually three, but I didn't add the third one because it's about real-time data communication and uh, it's a bit difficult to do. Um, but GraphQL works fine if you work with queries and mutations. Queries should just return results. They are basically HTTP gets. They should not change something on the server, whereas mutations are meant to be for changing data. When I want to do a mutation, I have to actually write a mutation. And uh, here the query is optional. Query is basically the default, and I can also give it a name. Um, this is useful if you have a lot of things defined. And these two object types are our entries. So there are queries, that's an object type that has two fields, and mutations, that's an object type that has three fields. And we can use them to actually then modify our API. And I've done here a create, read, update, and delete, um, and called it, yeah. Maybe I should have called this delete post. So all the arguments to a mutation, are they also nullable? No, usually not. Um, there, of course, okay. it makes sense that they are not nullable. And if you change the arguments and add a required argument, that, again, is a breaking change to your schema, right? Um, and so what you need is to build a schema. And a schema you can build from two, um, from two um, object types, as we can see in the type definition here. So a schema is just a function that takes an object type of some maybe a type, this is the root and the specific context. And it also takes an option, a second type. So a, a schema always needs a query type, but not always needs a mutation type. 
it's totally fine to just create a read API, but um, a GraphQL schema without a query, uh, query object doesn't work. And then let's actually see how a post looks like because I think that's an, an, an interesting, simple example. Um, so you can create a new post um, by, defining, uh, by defining its fields, its name, and the description, right? So in our code, we built new GraphQL object types. And then we can use these object types left and right and compose them, add them to each other. They can also be recursive and so on. I've been using uh, or heavily been um, inspired by the GraphQL JS library, how they do it, and also by Sangria. So we can have a quick maybe look into how GraphQL JS works. Can we see an object type here? No, that's a bit sad. So here, here you're defining the schema, right? And uh... Right, we can maybe see it in a second. Let me quickly see how we can build object types because I think this is a bit, uh, this is all not about GraphQL.js, right? Uh, okay, let's stay in pure script. This is what we're familiar with. I have, a, I have a question about the schema. I, I feel like at one time I was looking at GraphQL and uh, they said the schema has to be defined in a separate file and in a, in in a separate uh, uh, file format. Yes. Uh, so there, there is, is actually a language to describe GraphQL schemas. It's called schema definition language. And a lot of people use this language to define how the API looks like and then they just implement the resolvers. GraphQL JS itself doesn't do that. It actually gives you um, classes to build these object types. So you do this in your code and not in a separate language. Um, both have pro and cons. In PureScript right now, we need to use um, the, the programmatic part basically and use functions because if we use functions, we can actually use all the cool type features around PureScript. So um, to create a new object type, we have the function object type from GraphQL and we give this object type a name, which is a string. We give it a description, it's optional. We could also simply pass nothing. We don't want to have a description, but descriptions are just a, uh, um, uh, good practice, right? Everything should have somehow a description. We can also hunt for the bug uh, that where I had an outdated description. And then I define the fields because object types are the equivalent of records in PureScript. Um, we also have something to describe primitives, which are Scala types. So a Scala type is a string or a number. In GraphQL, we actually have int and float like we do in pure script. Um, you can return booleans and um, and what is the last one? I think I mentioned them all. Um, and we can see here, once we reach this a Scala, basically then we are as deep in as it gets, right? Um, or the string. This, these are our leaf types, if you think about graph terminology. These are leaves because you cannot go deeper. Is the ID a scalar type? Yes, an ID is also a scalar type. Um, it has some some nice quirks, but it's basically uh, a string. Um, but you can easily introduce new scalar types, which is pretty cool because um, you can use them, for example, to make it your schema more expressive simply using the type name, right? You can say, oh, that's an ID or that's an email, or that's a date, even though all of them are strings in JSON, but the client would know more about what to do with the, with the type using, yeah, basically using a type alias as you would do in, in PureScript, for example. And um, there are also enum types. Uh, in this example, there's no enum. Um, but basically the, the gist of it is that when you have these connections, right, that is the interesting part in GraphQL, you use these um, resolvers 
and resolvers are just pure functions. And that is pretty cool because writing functions is what we want to do when we're in a functional programming language, right? Um, so the resolvers is basically what GraphQL is all about if you follow this execution. So when we look at this example here with the post, um, what will happen, the server receives this query and it will then run a, a parser to parse it into an AST. And then what it will do is it will go and check out what is the first, um, the first subfield under query. Then it will go to the query type and get the resolver for the post field. Then it will execute this post resolver with three arguments. The first argument is the parent. Uh, queries don't really have a parent, so um, but you could give it one, basically a default value. Um, then it passes the arguments, which in this case is a record of um, one field, which is ID of type string. And then it also passes a context. The context is where we store all of our information that we want to share across the whole uh, HTTP request and across a whole query. Um, ideally, you would never modify it, but the context is usually where we have, for example, a database connection or a cache. And then it will go and execute the, take this post, take the return value and use it to execute the resolver of ID of content and of title. It will pass in the result of the post resolver to the ID resolver as a first argument. It will not pass any arguments because the field does not have any arguments and it will pass the same context again. So it goes through all of this. If we query all posts, it will actually do even more. Um, we, have, we have two posts, right? So each of these internal resolvers will be called twice, once with this object and once with this object. So resolvers are really how um, these complex queries work. You get some kind of parent object and then you need to resolve the result of your type. Um, and now we get to the actually interesting part of why I chose PureScript and why I wanted to make an implementation for PureScript. It's because typing these resolvers is really, really hard if you are, for example, in JavaScript because you need a really powerful type system that can actually gener generate these types for you. And PureScript can do that um, Scala is not quite as good, but it somehow works not as nice as I would like it. And I think with PureScript, we, we finally have a programming language that is uh, strong enough. Um, okay, excuse me, you said that uh, you have to ge generate some types mm -hmm. in like a JavaScript yeah. GraphQL server? Right. So for GraphQL, uh, the GraphQL JS has flow types. Um, but the biggest problem with, with the flow types for uh, GraphQL.js is that they are not very good. So if we look into uh, the object type here, GraphQL object type, um, the fields are of type object, GraphQL field config, right? And there it takes a resolve function and the resolve function, unfortunately, where can we see it? Here, um, it has lots of any types. <laughs> that means basically like, <laughs> oh, we actually can't really give you the types for that. But actually you could if your type system was strong enough. Okay, so if we actually look at the type of this object type, it's, a bit complicated, but um, on the other hand, it's not too hard. So what you want, what we can see here is the resolver. Um, the fields all need to be uh, of type context and A, which is the root type. So if I have a post type, all of these fields need to take a post as a parent element, right? All of them need to take the same context as my type 
and they itself need to return what they promise to return. So if this field returns a non-nullable ID, this resolver needs to return a string. If I don't do that, if I return a number, uh, it's angry about this, right? It says, okay, cannot match type in this thing, right? That's just usual pure script. Uh, in GraphQL, uh, we, uh, in JavaScript, we would be happy to have that though, because the type definition for JavaScript, um, where is it? Yeah, uh, it just says um, return value any, <laughs> right? We don't know. Um, but in pure script, we can actually derive that using the field function and say, okay, this is actually a field of type, um, oops, here, that has this return type B. So the resolver actually returns an AFF of type B. So that works. What also works is um, getting the, uh, deriving the resolver type when you have arguments. And this is where row types um, come in. But uh, I'll explain that later. Maybe I can just go on with, uh, with the presentation. Um, so to turn a query into a result, we execute these resolvers one after another. And uh, if then all resolvers have been running and returned the right values, we have, are able to kind of compose the result from all the, all the results of the resolvers. Um, here it is again. So a resolver is usually a function that takes a parent value, the arguments, the context, and then it somehow asynchronously needs to return some result. And I chose AFF um, <laughs> because uh, nobody likes promises. Well, I think, I think promises are pretty okay. Uh, they're also one of my starting points to functional programming. But <laughs> AFFs are, of course, much nicer, right? They have some more features. They enable this do notation. And actually, if we would just try, and I think there was an article recently describing how they would, um, would simply write these uh, resolvers in pure script and then just kind of import them from JavaScript and run them. And that means that you have to write the types yourself and you have to find like promises, which you don't really want to do. You also don't want null values. Like null values are not fun, right? We want maybes, really. <laughs> because then you get all the nice things around maybes, pattern matching and binds and do notation if you want to. Mm -hmm. And uh, the last uh, choice around this where derived a bit from the, um, from the JavaScript one is we want functions. We don't want config objects. Um, I think this is really debatable because in my opinion, um, the JavaScript would be a bit more readable, right? Um, here you actually just say, okay, object type, hmm, string, description, hmm, some fields. Um, when we would write that in JavaScript, um, I can do that real quick. We would write something like uh, post type, new GraphQL, object type just for reference how it would look like in JavaScript and then um, we would say name is post description is some post in my blog so this is an example of a resolver if you implemented it in JavaScript yes this is how it would look like in JavaScript and then fields it's basically the same and uh, here we have basically these config options, right? Uh, that we have and the type is uh, new GraphQL non null. String, no, GraphQL ID. Let's leave out the descriptions and then resolve. And uh, resolve, actually, I have to type myself. Oh, we actually don't need that. We can just say uh, parent and uh, parent.id. The nice thing here though is in JavaScript, for example, we can just return a value because JavaScript is so loosely typed that we don't have to return a promise. We could if we want to, but we don't have to say like promise.resolve. And basically, which is the equivalent of pure, right? Um, we don't have to do that. Or we don't have to supply the description 
or also the resolver is optional because this is just the default resolver. So in JavaScript, this would already satisfy it. Unfortunately, in PureScript, this is really hard to do, like create these very uh, optional um, interfaces. So I went with pure functions or just with functions. Um, and this is very much um, inspired also by Sangria uh, that we can have a quick look into. So Sangria is the Scala implementation and it basically does the same, right? It says, okay, object type, a string. Then we have the description, which is also a string. Then we have some interfaces that doesn't work in uh, PureScript GraphQL yet. Um, <clears throat> so you can do like a lot of cool things with GraphQL. Not everything works yet. Uh, and there will be some more work going on. And then you have fields and then again, some fields. Um, also, what, what was a design choice that I made was using these um, records here for the fields. I think a valid thing could have also been some kind of uh, foldable or array that you could just supply and then you would have to supply the ID as a first argument or the name as a first argument. Um, I think that's, that's uh, yeah, I, I like it like this. It's very close to the, um, to the JavaScript one. And I can, for example, when I do the mapping, when I pass it to the JavaScript library, I can just throw in the object, right? I don't, I don't have to uh, change it in some way. I can just pass it over, which is cool. Um, yeah, and let's actually look at a bit more uh, difficult example. So this is how it would look like in JavaScript. So it's very much inspired by the Scala and by the JavaScript library. Um, yeah, I wonder if there's like a type class that uh, abstracts over the idea of a record. Because the record is uh, uh, tags or labels plus type, like type. It's, it's like a collection of type labels. But I don't know if there's a type class that just um, is like that. It's like a, a heterogeneous tagged typed collection type class. Yeah, anyways, yeah, I'll let you continue. <laughs> yeah, I think there are probably ways of doing that, and I will explore some of that. Uh, GraphQL, uh, PureScript GraphQL is my first PureScript library, so I'm also, that was really my learning project. Um, mm -hmm. And I, I learned a lot. It took me ages to get to the next thing, um, <laughs> which is all about a row to list. Right. Uh, <laughs> list, it's great. Uh, it allows you to make uh, much better type safe interfaces with uh, using record primitives. I absolutely love it. It's the key point that makes the, yeah. um, this implementation so much nicer. Um, but I spent like two months on just forgetting one functional dependency. And I was like questioning if that's even the right way to do it. Yeah. And I wrote like imaginary stack overflow posts until I, until I found like this one functional dependency that I was missing. And then I was blown away how well it works. So <laughs> that's yeah. cool. Um, when, can, yes, yeah. please go. Oh yeah, sorry to interrupt. But one, one other way to define an API like that is to, um, sort of build it up one step at a time. So you would say um, using using just plain functions and function composition, and then you use row cons with that instead of row to list. But if you want examples of that, um, the PureScript variant library has um, has this like on handler that handles one case of a variant and then you can handle the rest of them. Mm -hmm. um, and the variant library also provides handlers where you provide a record of all the handlers so it goes and builds up that function too. So that sounds interesting. I'll definitely have a look. So that's for building up the schema? Yeah, you could do something like that. Um, I'll send the link to the variant thing I'm looking at. Um, but yeah, you could build up a schema like that. It would look something like. Uh, hmm. 
yeah yeah i think maybe we could um what i was saying before is that i could also imagine that this uh this very close to the javascript library uh kind of interface would be something like a base for building other abstractions on top so um i could imagine that um we could have something that is very similar to uh the haskell uh haskell one that we can maybe find somewhere here oh, there's always this um um so oh, it's a Haskell implementation. Nice. It doesn't seem to be really maintained. So, <laughs> and uh, like I think all all Haskell libraries lacks documentation. I was uh, I was joking a bit that most PureScript libraries just work like they're equally as badly documented uh, Haskell library. <laughs> so, uh, that's sometimes a bit hard to get into PureScript. Um, I hope I'm. I'm doing a bit better job I'm with my library. Uh, so there's also a tutorial avail available if you're interested that I'm writing right now. Um, but the Haskell library kind of has a bit more of this approach of um, building things up one step after another and kind of composing them, composing types. And uh, maybe that could, uh, PureScript GraphQL would kind of serve as a base and then you uh, create other abstractions on top. So I think there's lots to explore. Uh, let's have a quick look at at how a query works that we can actually see the, the use case for uh, row to list. So we've seen this kind of post query and a post, the queries are also just fields in an object type that I just called query. Um, you can actually choose what object type you want to use as your query when you build a schema. and uh, they use the field function without this, uh, without this, what is this called? Um, the small kind of uh, quotation. Um, and this enables you to actually pass in arguments because our, our post uh, query should actually ask for an ID of a post that we have in our database so that we can make this kind of get by ID query. Um, and we can simply supply uh, a record here also that needs also to be uh, uh, homogeneous, I guess. Uh, so it, ah, this is the right one. Um, and it has like this very um, two kind of type class constraints. The first one is the type that I'm supplying uh, for the field, the, the return type actually needs to be an output type, but also um, it needs to have this kind of arc declaration to arcs. So that's basically the arguments that I declare my field has needs to be reflected in the arguments that the resolver takes. So we can say, oops, now we lost it again. Um, the declared arguments need to match or be in some kind of relation with the arguments that the resolver takes. As we can see here, the resolver takes args as a second argument, right? And our function takes the arguments as a declaration. Um, and what we will then see is that I get the uh, type of arguments also inferred, and this is using row to list. So basically it says, okay, if I have uh, this record type with an, a field called ID and this ID is an argument type and this argument type has the type non-nullable ID, we actually, um, we can actually, or this argument here, uh, this record type here is kind of very similar. It contains an ID and that is of type string. So if we do something like remove this non-null constraint, we will get here a nice error message that tells us, hey, I cannot match maybe string with type string because read post expects uh, an ID. And what we can do instead is we could say something um, as ID of Uh, 
just say just X. Uh, need to import that, I guess. Does that work? No. Ah, pure. <laughs> so now the ID argument is optional. And if I don't supply it, I just always get null back or nothing back. Uh, we can actually check that out um, if we want to. We need to restart our server. And then we will actually see how this reflects in our documentation. And we now say, okay, ID is now optional. And we can actually no longer have to supply this, but then we always get null back. So the the types are 100% inferred and we can do no errors because That's on beautiful. the outside we have a, a typed API and that 100% translates to the types of the resolver function, which is the bread and butter of uh, writing the server side code. So we can basically do no errors and that is, uh, I guess the beauty of this pure script GraphQL implementation. That's beautiful. Right. Uh, see, that's basically already the end, I guess, of my talk. So row types and row to list are really awesome. I think it's really fun. And it's actually, um, that's really unique, I guess, um, to pure script because Sankria is also very, um, very good. The Scala type system is also very cool, but um, maybe we can see here how they do arguments. Um, draw it. Hmm, let's see if they have some arguments. Okay. Um, so when in, in Scala, you have to kind of define an argument outside um, and say, okay, I have this episode argument here. And um, then in your context object, um, you can basically say, call a function that says, I want the value for this argument, um, which is basically uh, their way of solving this because in Scala, you cannot, um, the system is not powerful enough to actually um, take a type from here, take the arguments from here and put them all the way through the type system so that they end up in this context object, right? This is something that I think uh, very few languages can actually do something that complicated, uh, calculating different um, shapes of objects and transforming them. And this is uh, what was really fun to work with in PureScript. You said that Scala has this uh, like get hero function to kind of unwrap that argument type. Uh, no, this get hero is just on the context, some database call. Um, this, this is really the interesting part where it says context argument optional. And this is where, which actually returns the argument, right? And, um, then they can write a, write a simple function. That is something like, uh, how would you express that in pure script? Um, something like get arg, and then we have something like argument. A, A, or in this, I think here it's called arc optional and something like this, right? So the context actually contains and in Scala contains this function argument optional, takes an argument of some type and then returns the value in that, in that particular instance, right? Because in Scala, you, the um, the arguments don't travel basically from here, from this argument to this argument. But this is what we can do in PureScript. Um, so they work around this by basically providing this get arg or arg opt function um, that can do that for them. So you still type save. I think it's just not as beautiful. Um, because you then cannot define your arguments in line in your function itself. They need to be defined outside. Um, but I guess it's, it's 
quite okay. Uh, the Scala implementation does some other cool stuff. For example, what they can do, um, where can we see that, for example? Um, as I said, we always have to return this AFF, so um, this asynchronous uh, Mona, um, always of the same type. Maybe we could also work a bit on that, but uh, Scala, for example, um, has a lot of things that you could actually return. You can return a value, you can return try value, um, so each field can fail, actually. If there's an error in the field, there will be a GraphQL error also, and the field will return null. Um, we can do the same with AFF. We can just let it fail. Um, you can return a future. You can return a partial value. Um, that's just a part of the result was successful, and there were some errors. Um, and you have these deferred, apparently. I don't quite understand how they work. Maybe I should ask uh, Oleg a bit about this, um, which apparently is how you usually would do that, um, which is, is kind of a way of more like a stream, right? Let's say you have to return a list of some value. You can already return some values and the the results will be executed one after each other, like in a stream. So it will already re uh, execute uh, resolvers down the line for values that are already there. Um, that's something that we, for example, cannot do right now in, in PureScript. We have to say, okay, these are all the posts, the moment I have all the posts, not if they come in throttling like you have in streaming libraries usually. Cool. Um, I think there are some more awesome things to check out. Um, so I first, I'd really love if you have some feedback, we can talk about it now, or you can open some issue in the library. Um, I'm not, not heavily using the library myself. So um, I hope to soon build something at home where it's a bit bigger that uses all types of things. Uh, funny first issue was already like, oh, you actually can create um, recursive object types because um, PureScript actually doesn't like it if you reference a value from somewhere else that's also a value, then it says, oh, this value is actually undefined here. You cannot do that. Then you have to wrap it in a function. Um, that's also what GraphQLJS does or uh, Sangria. You have to wrap it in a function that it can be recursive. So I added a field, uh, uh, this field recursive or uh, object type recursive function. So I think a lot of these things will slowly pop up where, where we'll find out, oh, that actually doesn't work that well, or this is really hard to do right now. So I hope that I can develop the library further in that direction. But if you have like specific, um, ideas about uh, the interface itself. Uh, please don't hold them back. I'm really not an expert. I have, uh, so let's see, I have to double check, but is the uh, API right now require AF as the monad mm -hmm. of choice? Yes. Okay, have you, have you, have you explored at making it um, just like any monad? Yeah, I think that's like, uh, like a generic M. <laughs> yeah. I haven't yet, and I think that uh, that's basically what I just realized um, when I talked about what Scala can actually take here, is that we can maybe make it a bit more general and just uh, say we take this kind of class of types. Um, that would be, I think, cool. Um, I think um, maybe monad um, fail, I guess, is something that we certainly want to need because fields should actually uh, be able to fail. Um, and that would, for example, already, I think that's the right type class. I'm really not good at type classes. Uh, are there are there any uh, aspects of F in particular that you are uh, using? Mm -hmm. Like like any, because let's see, like F you can do, you can make a fiber, you can uh, you know do this kind of stuff. Yeah. Or are you mainly using it for the callback aspect of it? Uh, like the, like a continuation one ad. Yeah, I think I um I think it has everything that promises have. This is why I I kind of went with it. So um it's lets you return asynchronous computations basically. 
So I have a value that I need to um, that I need to defer. Basically, I cannot answer it yet. That is, for example, what we do here with the post, right? Read post actually returns an F. Um, so this is something, and then of course it needs to be a kind of fail. So there needs to be the possibility to throw exceptions in a sense, or to uh, like an item mm -hmm. turn left or right. So basically this combination of both things led me to F. Okay. Um, yeah. The, right, the reason I ask is because I uh, wrote an, uh, what do you call it, the, the Pucks, that framework, and its API forced me to use AF, like only AF. Mm -hmm. And I really wished that it was just like, that I could use a monad transformer on there so that I could have, uh, what do you call it, a state monad on top of that AF so I could store some you know, global configuration for my application. Um, yeah, so yeah, if possible, it'd be nice to just say like any M that uh, has an F you know, aspect to it. Yeah. Um, that'd be, that'd, that'd be kind of nice. Um, let's see, there was one other thought I had on that too. Oh, um, if you want to return different types of values from your resolvers, like you said that the Sangria had the deferred and mm -hmm. uh, some other, something else. Maybe you could use a, 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 a like yeah, just like a tagged unit, like a like a sum type. Um, mm -hmm. But like, I'm not sure how I'm not sure how, how you do that. Um, and that, that that might be better for like a user land of this, like user of this library, rather than in the library API itself. I don't know. I don't know. Yeah, but I think already like a better uh, type class or like just making this instead of F directly. Um, describing the mm -hmm. um, the properties of um, the the monad that is used uh, could already enable us, for example, to return either, right? Because either would uh, have the ability to fail, but uh, it would be a synchronous return, which is often what we want to do, right? Um, in the in the post, for example, um, we don't want to have all this overhead. We would just like to return the ID of the parent. That's just an object lookup. It's not something really expensive that needs to, it's not even a side effect, right? It's just pure. Um, yeah. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, yeah, where was I? Something specific, I don't know. Um, yeah, and I think there are also a lot of cool things around GraphQL to, to check out. I think another uh, project that I would like to mention is uh, Hasura, if you're like into, into Haskell. Um, that's a totally different idea. What they do is they take a GraphQL query and transform it to an SQL statement on PostgreSQL. So that's a completely different idea where they say um, each GraphQL query has a matching SQL query and that makes it really fast to execute that. Whereas um, with these uh, with these resolvers, it kind of gets expensive. Another thing that's difficult in resolvers is what happens to n plus one queries. So let's say I return um, a bunch of posts and we would add another field to the posts, uh, which is author, and then we would get uh, would look up a user in the database. Um, so in post, actually, there would be a, a resolver call that says, hey, please um, get me the, the author with this ID, for example, ID one. And next post also has the same question. And the next post has author with ID two. Um, so we would end up with three queries to our database. And if we now go deeper and deeper into the graph, actually it starts to get really ugly because we suddenly have a single query that executes 200 uh, SQL statements. And all of them are really similar. All of them are like select ID, name, and email from user where ID one or where ID two. And sometimes they're even the same queries, right? And Facebook developed something that is called data loader. Oops. <laughs> nice generic name. Um, 
data loader, which is a very cool thing that does, um, that takes a batch function and then it does for you um, batching, caching, and um, getting uniques out basically. And I still haven't found, that's the first thing I wanted to do as a toy project basically, turn this data loader into a library. And I felt like my, my pure script skills weren't um, good enough to come up with a very, like with a dogmatic way of how to do that. Because it's a very, um, it's a very impure thing that happens in the background. Um, but on the other hand, it exposes a pure API, so to say, that says, okay, I have this effect in the background, but I can just say, I want to load the user with this ID and I will take care that there will just be one batch query that is sent after all IDs have somehow throttled in and it makes these resolvers performant again. And it's a real, um, real upgrade actually when you use these data loaders. But I think um, the PureScript GraphQL uh, library will not be usable without uh, something similar like this data loader from Facebook. Yeah, so this is one of the, I'm glad you brought this up because I was gonna forget to ask this, but this N plus one thing, I think is one of the most interesting parts of a GraphQL server. <laughs> um, yeah, so here you, you say that this data loader will help you to reduce the number of queries that get sent to your database you know, while resolving a complex query. But right now in this uh, PureScript GraphQL wrapper, there's no N plus one, you know, it doesn't try and attempt to solve this N plus one problem right now. Yes, is that right? Right. And okay. Cause yeah, I, I do remember looking at seeing how some of the other servers handle this N plus one problem. And it seems like what they do is they use context or some global mutable state while resolving a query so that, uh, yeah. And I was, you know, if it works, it works. And, uh, but I've, I've always been curious, like, huh, I wonder how you would express that in PureScript yeah. language. And I think that is a thing that we will have to solve. Um, but you, I have a lot of experience using it in, GraphQ, uh, in JavaScript's GraphQL. And what we actually do is we use um, a really cool thing, which is called PostLoader. I hope we can find this. Oh. Um, we create, we use this post loader, which is a code generation tool that creates flow types on our Postgres database. So it creates all these uh, loaders for us. And instead of working with a GraphQL, uh, with a Postgres uh, SQL connection where we execute queries, we have a big object where all the data loaders are initialized for each request. And I really like it because the interface from the outside looks really pure. It's just like, I want this object with this ID, I get a promise and it resolves. And I think we can do the same with PureScript where from the outside, it looks really pure. Uh, it's really easy to use, but behind the scenes, there is like really JavaScript specific stuff going on where we wait for ticks of the event loop, uh, defer uh, execution of promises until the batch kind of gets started. Um, but, the user of the data loader doesn't, um, is not bothered by any of this. They can just use the library, the abstraction. And uh, I think if we would do something similar with PureScript, that would be equally easy to use. But the question still remains, like how would, would this function, uh, how would this look like, how would we how would we actually build some kind of dogmatic uh, description of the types of data loader? The thing in Haskell that sounds like that data loader library in Facebook is a library called Haxl, H-A-X-L. Um, I think it uses applicative notation to, uh, so that you can, in one function, you can define multiple queries to different or the same resource 
and it will deduplicate and batch those queries into the same request. And there is an implementation that's very similar um, in Pure Script. I think it's, I forget the name. Maybe it's called uh, Skull or Resource or yeah. something like that. That sounds great. I mean, this is um, by Facebook apparently. So, um, yeah, but uh, I, I, I think because you're using AF and that's like a monadic, um, you know, data type. So I don't think you could use that, this same thing. You'd have to have like a monadic uh, deduplicator. Mm -hmm. Makes sense. I'm not sure how that would look then. Yeah. Yeah, this is exactly the Haskell equivalent. That's a good, a good um, tip here. And if we have mm -hmm. something similar in PureScript or we just build something similar, um, that will be great. Yeah, right. Rightfold is the one that wrote uh, pure script analog to this. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, I'm not sure if it would work for this because the issue is it's a, across different resolvers. If it's in one resolver, then you could maybe use expli um, applicative notation to make multiple requests to different things. But the problem is that in GraphQL, um, one query is resolved in multiple different resolvers, yeah. right? Um, and this is this is what yeah. So you have to have cooperate, cooperation across yeah. different resolvers. They, and that's the hard they part. They need to share one state. Like they need to sh share one cache. Uh, this is the mm -hmm. important part. And this is what the context is for, right? The context value in your GraphQL uh, resolvers needs to hold some kind of state, and you need to work with that so that these functions look pure on the outside, but underneath they are kind of communicating with each other and waiting for each other to uh, stack up a bunch of IDs and then send them to, to a backend. But on the other hand, this could also be imagined as a kind of an, an additional layer on top of your database connection. So you could, for example, write a generic um, SQL data loader that just looks for similar SQL queries and then puts them together. So it's not, not much more impure than, uh, or not doing more than the database IO. Um, it's just a kind of a in-memory cache on top that does some extra stuff. Cool. Yeah, this is a fascinating problem. I think somebody would have a lot of fun trying to solve that puzzle. Yeah. All right. That's it from me. It took actually quite long. <laughs> I was well, yeah, I had fun. I think it's a fun discussion. That will, that will be done after like half an hour and everyone will be like, yeah, maybe I'll do some GraphQL in my free time. <laughs> <laughs> but, um, I think it's, it's really fun to write front-end code for GraphQL as well as back-end code. It has, uh, and my company really solved um, a lot of problems in the front end. For example, we no longer use Redux. Like hmm. clients are so advanced, they do all the, they automatically do the fetching on mount, they do um, the normalization of the store, they do updates. When you do mutations where types update, they automatically update the cache, the client side cache. So it's really fun to use with on the front end. And on the back end, I feel like writing resolvers is much more fun than writing middleware and kind of endpoints and have these long discussions with front-end engineers about what fields they need and what type they are. Um, the schema is a really cool thing to, um, to argue about and to have one common language of what your API exposes. And then often you find yourself reusing not, the, not only functions or code, but you find yourself reusing big parts of your API surface, right? So the moment you kind of use the user type now, not only as the author type, but also as the commenter type, you don't have to write um, resolvers again for it because you can just reuse the type of the API, which is somehow another level of code you use. Yeah, uh, thanks, uh, Enric. That was a very good presentation. I learned about GraphQL and PureScript, so thank you. Yeah, thanks for having me. Yeah, um, sounds like there's uh, no more questions at this time. Um,
Yeah, I guess we could end now, unless unless there's some other topics that somebody needs to uh, talk about. No, not for me. Cool. Well, yeah, thanks a lot for coming uh, coming on in such uh, short notice up to this uh, meetup, Hendrik. I really appreciate it. It's, it's a lot of fun to discuss topics like this. Great. Yeah, thank, thank you very much. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thanks for listening. Thanks for being interested. And uh, I also want to put out a big thanks to everyone who helped me learn uh, GraphQL, the Slack community, and the Discourse Forum. Uh, I think it's really lovely community even though it's small but that makes it so so uh family like uh, which i think <laughs> really, really cool and um gives you the ability to really explore and learn in, in a really nice way yeah cool well we'll cool. see you around we'll see you around then uh, hendrik definitely all right yep Thank, yeah thanks for joining all thank you yep. take care bye, bye.